thank you everybody for coming this evening and thank you most of all for being involved in the democratic electoral process and get the word out there is an election in 26 days and it is easier to vote now in San Francisco than it has ever been and easier than virtually anywhere else in the United States of America. When I first started as a supervisor 22 years ago, uh, very few people got their ballots by mail. Now we all do. In the old days, you had to stick a whole bunch of stamps on there. Now the city passed a law that we do that. You can register much closer to the end of the election. As a matter of fact, if you are not registered to vote, you can show up at a polling place and vote on election day. So there are no excuses not to do so, but I'm sure all of you, uh, by virtue of the fact that you are attending today, uh, will be voting. So thank you for that. Um, I want to start out with something that Diana and the Barbary Coast folks who I speak to at virtually every election are familiar with, and that is a little bit of background on how things get on the ballot and why. And I think that is important um, because there's a lot of background to each and every one of these stories. Uh, and some things get on the ballot through the uh, initiative petition um, process, and some of them get on the ballot by the entire Board of Supervisors voting. Um, so let me just go, and some of them can be put on directly by the mayor. Some of them can be put on with less than a majority of the board. So let me just uh, give you the 101 on that. And if you've heard it before, I am sorry, but I'm gonna repeat it just a little bit. Um, we have in San Francisco, our own, if you will, constitution that is called the city charter. And the city charter lays out the roles and responsibilities of the mayor, the board of supervisors, the city attorney uh, sets forth which commissions uh, have what authorities over what departments. Um, as well as many other uh, aspects. And that document can only be amended or changed by a majority vote of the electorate of San Francisco. And there are two ways that a charter amendment can end up on the ballot. A majority of the Board of Supervisors must in public deliberations vote to put it on the ballot, or 10% of the registered voters uh, can qualify a charter amendment for the ballot, which very rarely happens because it is a very expensive undertaking to obtain that many signatures. Um, this is actually one of the very few occasions in the 22 years since I was first elected that there is a charter amendment on the ballot that was put on by a initiative signature uh, campaign, and we'll get to that as Proposition D. The second uh, type of thing that is on the ballot is an ordinance. Uh, the Board of Supervisors in its normal role is charged with the lawmaking process and the passage or amendment of ordinances. And those are everything from our planning code to our fire code, to our building code, to our local tax code, uh, to our public works code, uh, and the list goes on. It fills up um, a shelf of uh, codes in my office. Um, and occasionally uh, ordinances end up on the ballot and they can end up on the ballot in one of three ways. The Board of Supervisors in a public process by a majority vote can put something on the ballot, uh, an initiative ordinance on the ballot. Um, the electorate can put an initiative ordinance on the ballot with 5% of the voters who voted in the last mayoral election, which is at this time approximately 8,900 and some odd signatures from valid registered voters in San Francisco. An initiative ordinance can also be placed on the ballot by a subset of four supervisors with no public process. They can just four members of the board can submit directly to the Department of Elections pursuant to the rules of the charter an initiative ordinance. It has a long, interesting story that goes back to the uh, corrupt days of the early 1900s as to why that is in our charter today and has been in our charter for over 100 years. Uh, and the last way an initiative ordinance can be put on the ballot, and we have one of these, is with the sole signature of the mayor. Now, let me tell you one other thing, because I know that we have 14 
uh, local measures, actually 15, one of them was taken off by a court, which is a rare thing. That was Proposition K, which we will skip over. Uh, the other thing people should know is that in the state of California, a tax approval, if put on by the Board of Supervisors or City Council, if you have a city council, requires a two-thirds supermajority vote to pass. However, if a tax measure is put on the ballot by popular signature, it only needs 50% plus one to pass. And we have an example of that uh, on this ballot in the form of Proposition M. Um, it, our, I don't know, Diana or Nick, I can't see the chat, but if you have any questions about that, if not, I will just dive in. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and let me say, I am I, over the last many years, I've done this with my supervisorial predecessor uh, in his role as a state assembly member, David Chu, who has always covered the state measures, and I've always covered the local measures. Um, so if we have time left and we get to the state measures, I will tell you I am completely unqualified to give you uh, the state measures, but I will do my best, um, but not in... Uh, not with the insights that I have uh, with this stuff. So Proposition A uh, is exactly what it says. I was actually initially, um, this was placed on the ballot. This is a charter amendment um, by an 11 to nothing vote of the Board of Supervisors. Interestingly enough, our pension uh, provisions, and I think this is quite smart, um, are ensconced in the charter and they cannot be changed willy nilly by the board of supervisors if they are under political pressure from employee organizations. Uh, they can only be changed by the electorate and they require a majority to be uh, placed, a majority vote. And here in this case with Prop A, it was a unanimous 11 nothing vote to place this on the ballot. Uh, this goes back to even before my time in 1996, when there was a ballot measure uh, that was designed um, around uh, employees' retirement benefits, uh, which has not been updated since it passed um, many, many moons ago, getting on to a quarter of a century ago. And there are a group of employees who felt wronged uh, at that time they litigated against the city early on in my tenure in the early 2000s and lost that litigation. Fast forward to 2022, uh, they, they have consistently tried to deal with uh, what they perceived and, and, and I think fairly uh, were some of the inequities um, to uh, a group of pensioners uh, that date back to 1996. Um, they have consistently lobbied the board over those years. Um, there are less and less of that class of retirees left because uh, actuarial tables are uh, real predictors and many of them are passing away, uh, but they prevailed on the board uh, with Supervisor Sapai leading the effort. I was initially a detractor, uh, but when the charter amendment was amended in a number of ways, two of them significant. One was uh, that I did not want this to cost the general fund very much money. When I uh, started out, our pension fund was woefully underfunded. Uh, actually, in the last few years, it has been fully funded, which is a great thing that I'm very proud of. Um, but I wanted to make sure that this was not going to be a large hit on our general fund and uh, or our enterprise agencies. And let me just explain that for a quick second. Some of the pensioners' money comes not from ad valorem tax money, not from the city's general fund, but comes from enterprise agencies. For instance, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, which is our water and wastewater uh, purveyor uh, does not get any tax money. They get your water bill and sewer bill money. So that's not part of the general fund. It is part of an enterprise agency 
under the government. And my insistence was twofold. One, that the total bill and liability be less than $10 million per annum to the city in total, enterprise agencies and general fund. And two, that in economically difficult times when the pension fund was underfunded, that the amount of the pensioners' additional COLA could be decreased. I got both of those amendments. And uh, as you will see in the controller's fiscal analysis, the uh, cost to the general fund, which will go down over time because this group of pensioners uh, will eventually cease to exist, starts at $5 million per annum from the general fund with an additional estimated $3 million from enterprise agencies. And it has the various off ramps uh, for economically exigent times. Uh, that I insisted upon. It was uh, unanimously uh, put on by the board. You will see in the voter handbook, which is a fun document, if you have too much time on your hands to read, that there is no uh, organized opposition uh, and no opponent argument was submitted to the Department of Elections. Um, so that is Proposition A in a nutshell. I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions that people want to raise. No paid arguments and no questions here. I think we're good to go. All right. Uh, proposition B uh, is um, also a charter amendment. Uh, it is near and dear to me as I am the chief author of this charter amendment. Uh, this is something that seldom happens in politics. Uh, wherein a elected official, uh, th that being me, admits that uh, he participated in making a mistake. I generally hold that measures that have been publicly vetted and put on by the Board of Supervisors through a open and transparent process are usually better than measures that have not undergone that process. Uh, let me tell you about a something you're all painfully aware of, and I am very painfully aware of. Uh, in uh, the beginning of the year 2000, just a couple of months before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, the longtime head of our Department of Public Works, shamefully and embarrassingly uh, for the city and county of San Francisco, one Mohammed Nuru, was arrested by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and charged by the Department of Justice with any number of corrupt crimes. He has since been uh, found guilty and is about to go to jail in two months for a seven year prison term. Um, as somebody who has spent much of his life in um, governing and uh, for the city and county of San Francisco, um, I wanted to do uh, everything in my power to make sure that something like this would never happen again. Uh, the Department of Public Works, an agency that has been around for over 120 years, was one of the few departments that did not have a commission, a citizens oversight commission that reviewed uh, and approved contracts. Um, that publicly vetted their policies. Uh, and in the year 2020, um, the Board of Supervisors with my then colleague Matt Haney as the chief author placed a proposition, a charter amendment on the November 2020 ballot that one, created a public works commission and went further and split the Department of Public Works into two separate departments with two separate department heads and two separate commissions, the Department of Public Works and the Department of Sanitation and Streets. Um, the rollout for that as set forth in the Charter Amendment of two years ago was a two-year rollout. So as we uh, are discussing this today, the Department of Sanitation and Streets actually still does not exist, but is on the eve of existing. Along the way, I listened to the howls of the Department of Public Works, of our city administrator that I hold in high esteem, 
Carmen Chu, uh, of the past controller, Ed Harrington, of the current controller, uh, Ben Rosenfield, both of whom um, are uh, widely respected, that the split of the department did not make sense. Why didn't it make sense? Because of the duplication of numerous back of house positions. So it's not just that we have two department heads, uh, but we are going to have to duplicate HR personnel. We're going to have to duplicate uh, accounting personnel and the like, just to put new logos on existing uh, rolling stock, our existing vehicles, is a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, there were many things that were not well thought out in splitting the department. For instance, the Sanitation and Streets Department is charged with street repaving and street resurfacing, but the Bureau of Engineering that does the specification is still at the Department of Public Works, which means one department has a contract with another department, raising internal costs. Uh, as you will see in the official controller statement, uh, this uh, is going to cost a minimum of $6 million in the first two years. Uh, the controller said in, uh, has, in conjunction with the city administrators expects it to cost $10 million a year going forward. Um, and I, uh, after consulting with all of the aforementioned parties, thought that we should revisit this and have not split the department, keep one department head, but two commissions uh, with the Sanitation and Streets Commission being laser focused on that which drives us, drives us all crazy, which is policies and metrics and performance standards uh, as it relates to street cleanliness, sanitation, graffiti abatement, uh, and our tree maintenance standards. So that is what Proposition B is. Uh, it was a split vote on the Board of Supervisors with Supervisors Chan, Dorsey, Mandelman, Melgar, Preston, Ronan, and Stephanie joining me, and Supervisors Marr, uh, Safai, and Walton dissenting in putting it on the ballot. Uh, it is, uh, as you will see in the ballot handbook, um, has the support of uh, unlikely duos, including a ballot argument signed by the San Francisco Tenants Association that represents tenants' interests in San Francisco, who joined in an argument in support of Proposition B with San Francisco's landlords, represented by the San Francisco Apartment Association. Former mayors who don't agree on much, like Willie Brown and Art Agnos, have jointly signed uh, support arguments. Um, as have a slew of small businesses, community organizations, including the Telegraph Hill Dwellers, uh, and Proposition B enjoys the support of unlikely former state senators, Quentin Kopp and Mark Leno. Um, it is opposed by the Labor's Union uh, and former supervisor, now assembly member Matt Haney, uh, who were big proponents of the original measure for reasons that I am not entirely clear on, uh, one of their um, official uh, opponent statements is that the new Proposition B takes out the requirement that these departments be audited by the controller on an annual basis. Uh, the controller uh, does not have that requirement for any other department in the charter. The controller audits departments and portions of departments all the time, um, but doing an annual audit takes a huge amount of time and expense. They are in order for specific issues and items uh, and departments on a rolling basis. Uh, so we reverted in the new Proposition B um, to the overarching powers that the controller currently enjoys under the charter. That has been the thing that um, the anti-prop B forces uh, have been pointing to. Um, it is endorsed by the San Francisco Democratic Party, uh, the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, SF Travel, the list goes on, and I am happy to attempt to answer any questions on Prop B. Yeah, um, actually, just uh, really quickly, just to confirm, uh, you are in support of both Prop A and Prop B, correct? I am in support of both propositions. Yes, when I vote right. on the ballot, that means I support them. Yes, sir. Um, we've got one question here. Uh, it's um, in 2020, um, 
when you were in favor, uh, Supervisor, of the new sanitation department, the city controller estimated the cost. Uh, so looks like Ms. Rosenfeld had uh, estimated it would cost between two and six million dollars. Uh, he added, this measure for a new department permits the Board of Supervisors to delay portions of the measure's implementation, which could defer a portion of these costs until a later date. The controller has now refined the estimate to 3.5, so 2.6, now he's saying it's 3.5. Um, as this is considerably less than the original, and as the department budget could even be narrowed by the Board of Supervisors, why not give a newly created department a chance to do something DPW has proven to have woefully failed at? What are your yeah, thoughts so on that? Let, let, let me answer that in a few ways. First of all, the costs that the controller was predicting were costs as it related to establishing the new department, not the ongoing costs. The city administrator has since determined that those annual ongoing costs approach $10 million, about $9.7 million per, per annum, uh, which is money that can be spent uh, rather than on pushing paper on pushing brooms. Um, and I, I think one of, I, I think that in our overreaction to the scourge of corruption, the board went too far. It is my belief based on expert advice listening to the people who do this day in and day out, that this is going to make our streets dirtier, not cleaner. Okay. I mean, Thanks. I could have done the easy thing, which would have been to just brush it under the rug and say, hey, uh, I didn't make a mistake. But, and it's never fun to stand up and say that you participated in a mistake, but I think we did. And it's interesting because a number of the other individuals who put this on the ballot, um, Supervisor Ronan and Supervisor Preston were on the Board of Supervisors uh, when we originally voted to put it on the ballot and they too have come to the same conclusion and have reversed. Uh, Supervisor Mandelman, I will give credit to, uh, and Supervisor Stephanie as well, were in the minority uh, on the original 2020 measure. Gotcha. Um, is there anything that you think that uh, that could have been done differently? Um, you know, the first time around, like perhaps, you yeah, know, I, could there have been more data presented or? So, listen, I think, like I just said, we were all very embarrassed about the scourge of corruption that Mr. Nuru had visited upon us and in some ways uh, overreacted. And we now have the luxury of watching the implementation and, ex and its expense over two years of calming down and listening to folks that we probably, to be honest, should have listened to uh, two years ago. Um, but uh, all of that is water in the bridge. And like I said, the easiest thing to do would be just to let it go. But I think that we would live to regret that. So I'm doing the more difficult thing, um, which is asking for forgiveness and saying, hey, we can do oversight and we can do it right. And that's why the tagline for this campaign is oversight done right. Yeah, thank you. Um, by the way, again, just a reminder, if folks do have questions, please just type your questions into uh, the chat bar um, and then we'll be able to get them asked. Um, and if folks have down the road, you've got some questions that we're not that we don't get to, or you ask, and we're already on to the next proposition, uh, we'll do our best to come back to it uh, at the end. All right, um, moving on because I don't see any more here. Uh, Prop C, Homelessness Oversight Commission. Yeah, um, so Prop C uh, doesn't split the department, uh, and the the things evolve over time. Uh, when I first became a supervisor and up until just uh, a half a decade ago, um, homeless services existed in a plethora of different departments. They existed at the Department of Public Health. They existed in uh, the Office of Housing. Um, they existed at Public Works. They existed at the Human Services Agency. And in, 19, in uh, 2016, then Mayor Lee uh, uh, went to the Board of Supervisors and suggested that 
these functions be consolidated in a single department, which we by ordinance created, which was the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, uh, which department uh, enjoys um, some 600 plus million dollars a year in uh, our financial largesse and has uh, no oversight commission. Um, and in the same way, now that uh, we've discussed Proposition B, um, this is an effort to have that level of oversight where interested parties have a place to go, as many of us go to planning commission meetings and historic preservation commission meetings to make their views heard. Uh, this was proposed by Supervisor Safai and put on unanimously by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this is a split appointing authority commission with the mayor appointing four and the Board of Supervisors appointing three. Uh, there are certain seat qualifications uh, for those seats uh, that are set forth in the charter amendment, uh, including uh, a seat that would be uh, occupied by a person who has experienced homelessness or is experiencing homelessness, uh, somebody from representing uh, small business interests, uh, somebody representing um, advocacy interests, uh, somebody representing mental health service interests. Um, so there's, there's a, a series of seat qualifications that are set forth in that. And the Board of Supervisors voted unanimously to put this on the ballot. Uh, the costs to government are minimal. The, uh, there is no official rebuttal argument. Uh, there is one paid ballot argument against it from the San Francisco Republican Party. Yeah, um, I know, yeah, I see here, you know, the city controller uh, says that it's gonna have minimal impact, um, you know, in terms of cost, uh, but we do have a question from one of our guests here asking if you do know the cost of this. Um, the cost of the uh, the estimated costs of creating the commission are uh, set forth in the controller statement, and he believes they will not exceed three hundred and fifty thousand dollars per annum. Um, along what? Let's see. Um, we've got a question. What? Or what are the review criteria? Um, what is the authority if problems are found? I think that's, let's see, what is the review criteria? Is this, I'm wondering, are you asking about, um, you know, the commissioners and the review criteria for the commissioners? Sure. Just so, maybe get a bit of clarity so, on that. So I think the question, and I'm just assuming I may be wrong, um, is what, what is the role of a commission? What powers and authorities does a commission have? Um, the answer is that contracts are reviewed and approved by a commission. Contracts over $10 million or 10 years in duration are recommended by a commission to the Board of Supervisors. So anything over $10 million in cost or 10 years in duration pursuant to the charter then has to be approved by the Board of Supervisors. A department head can approve certain contracts under a uh, authorized level. Above that level, they have to be approved by the commission. Above $10 million, they have to be approved by the Board of Supervisors. So this is a forum where the public and the commission and Heretofore, staff from the Department of Homelessness has not had to go before a body, unless it's been over $10 million, and say, here's how we competitively solicited it, solicited a uh, service or procured things. We had three bidders. Here's how we scored the bidders. Uh, here's why we think we're getting the best value or the best product. All of that would be within the authority of the commission. This would be a place where, the, for instance, the Department of Homelessness is now in the midst of drafting and promulgating a five-year strategic plan. This would be the forum to for them to discuss it, for members of the public to go in and offer input 
on the adoption of the strategic plan. Um, so those would be the powers and authorities. These, this would be a body that could measure performance goals against actual deliverables. And this would be a body that could uh, review um, controllers audits of various functions within the department uh, and tell staff that they are not doing well enough. One of the fundamental roles of a commission under our system of government is to recommend three candidates when there is a vacancy of the department head to the mayor and the mayor can only pick from one of those three. I think I've, I think I've hit the highlights. <laughs> Thank you. Um, moving on. All right, Prop D here. I um, think we're getting to yeah two of the more controversial measures here, right? D and E coming up are in direct competition with each other. Uh, both relate to affordable housing. Uh, you can see D reached uh, the ballot from signatures, while E is being put on by the board of supervisors. Um, both require 50% plus one to be approved. My understanding is that if both are achieved or if both achieve that threshold, uh, whichever has more votes wins. Is that, is that right? That is correct. Uh, the one with most votes controls, uh, assuming that they both get over 50% plus one, the one with the most votes controls. Uh, these are both charter amendments. And before we talk about them, I do want to tell everybody a story about uh, something that is a part of my time in office. Uh, 20, in the year 2001, my then colleague, Mark Leno, who went on to become a California state senator, uh, proposed having a law by ordinance that the Board of Supervisors ultimately adopted that in new construction of buildings over 10 units in San Francisco, that 10% of them be affordable. And affordability was defined based on the uh, area median income. Um, over time, those numbers uh, were tweaked as um, the economy became uh, more heated and the percentage of uh, affordable housing at the area median income went up. In the year 2012, which was during my hiatus from the Board of Supervisors, a deal was struck by a number of different interests, um, most importantly, the then mayor, Ed Lee, wherein a measure, a charter me measure was put on the ballot that included a provision that the include this this uh, requirement for having a certain percentage be uh, affordable is called inclusionary housing. That um, the inclusionary rate in San Francisco be set at twelve percent. Once it got into the charter, it could not be changed. In bad economies, when that number arguably should have been lower, it could not be lowered in bumper superheated economies when uh, that number could be higher, there was no way to raise it. Uh, when I came out of my political hiatus um, and when I ran in this district in 2015, I said that if I was elected, I would do my best to get that out of the charter. And indeed in 2016, uh, then Supervisor Jane Kim and I sponsored and the board voted to put a charter amendment on the ballot that took that static item out of the charter and put it back in the realm where it could be adjusted. And uh, since that time, we have convened a expert technical advisory committee that includes developers and experts in the field. We are actually just seated that panel for the second time. Uh, that looks at the cost of construction, sale prices, geography, uh, how different neighborhoods perform. And we have, uh, it's been a, a dynamic number since. The reason I tell you this story is uh, I don't think that dealing with these things in the charter is a good idea. Let me tell you what happened here. Proposition D that was funded by um, 
three individuals who paid the uh, over $1 million it took to gather the uh, over 50,000 valid signatures that were needed um, changes the definition of affordability uh, and increases that from the maximum that has been used in San Francisco, which is 120% of area median income uh, to 140% of area median income. Um, it also uh, takes away from the city, uh, whether it is the planning commission uh, and various uh, bodies, including on appeal, the Board of Appeals, uh, and in certain limited instances on appeal, the Board of Supervisors, uh, from the process of development entitlements. Um, once it is passed, it cannot be changed. Uh, as a result of that signature gathering process, the Board of Supervisors offered Proposition E. So these things have to be taken together. Uh, Proposition E is also a charter amendment that keeps the 120% uh, number um, as well as uh, requires additional on-site affordable units in market rate development uh, and um, also requires uh, um, uh, that people who work on these buildings are skilled and trained and appropriately compensated. Uh, so those are the major differences between the two. Uh, I will tell you that um, while I voted to put Proposition E on the ballot, I don't think that either one of these uh, ultimately should be in the charter. Uh, it was a seven to four vote, as uh, the screen shows right now, uh, to put them to put this on the ballot. Uh, it is politically very charged. Uh, millions and millions of dollars are being spent on it. Uh, some people think that Proposition D uh, is a giveaway to developers, but ultimately, this is really, I think, a question of how we, as a city, uh, view what our housing need is. Um, I have uh, market rate housing, which in this city is very expensive, has we have exceeded our regional housing need goals uh, by 150%. Affordable housing to individuals that make 116,000 a year, which is 120% of AMI for a single individual, we have built less than 50% of our regional housing needs. Uh, my personal assessment is that Prop D takes us in the wrong direction. Uh, Prop E takes us in a better direction, but neither one of them should be on the ballot. These should not be static things. These should be dynamic and should be adjusted as markets change. Okay. I think uh, surprisingly no questions on that one. Let's uh, let's keep rolling here. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Prop F. Wait a minute. I, I have a question. I just posted it. Oh. Uh, it said, what is the current percentage of the total number of units in the entire project that must be affordable housing? This uh, E listed at 8%, D listed at 15%. What is it currently? The current... Uh... If I am to simplify this, the current percentage is 21%. And, there, and the reason I am simplifying it is as we phased in in 2016, the new affordable housing percentages, we realized um, and I think correctly so at the, uh, with the advice of the technical advisory committee that we convened in 2016, that various developers purchases, purchase prices for real property, for their base property, their land, uh, was predicated on the numbers that preceded them. And so we, for those units that were previously entitled, had a 
formula for what their percentage should, should be, but 21% is the current rate. Um, the, the other big difference between D and E that I did not, that I failed to speak to is what we fondly refer to as the use it or lose it provision, which is in the case of Proposition D, once you are entitled, uh, those entitlements last forever. Whereas in the case of Proposition E, there is an incentive to, if you, uh, once, once you use Proposition E, you have to actually proceed with your development in a two-year period. Uh, the notion being that what we want to do is incentivize the building of affordable housing and not uh, land banking entitlements. So that's another difference between D and E. All right, I think that's it. So let's jump over to Prop F. Thank I you. I think F is our, no, it's not our last charter amendment. Library, um, oh. Okay, this gets us into a whole nother world of public policy, which is at a high level, the notion of a set aside. Uh, set asides are, if you will, to a certain extent, unfunded mandates. One of the provisions that our charter has and that uh, are powers that are granted to legislative and executive bodies is the power of appropriation. So whether it's the United States, wh whether it's the President of the United States who proposes a budget to the United States Congress, or in our case, a mayor who proposes a budget to the Board of Supervisors, uh, the mayor proposes, the board disposes, uh, same with the Congress. Uh, a set aside is where the voters mandate that a certain percentage by formula of the budget is spent on a particular uh, need or cost or department. Um, I have had a very complicated relationship with set-asides uh, and have worked to reform set-asides and have, uh, in a number of instances, been uh, in the minority and, in one case, the lone vote against putting a set-aside on the ballot. Uh, that was not the case with Proposition F, which is a long-standing existing set aside, which is two and a half uh, cents uh, on a hundred dollars of assessed property value. This is uh, property taxes and how they are spent. That has a nerd uh, now. Uh, I think this will be the fourth extension of this set aside, wherein the voters are saying that they want a certain percentage of their property taxes to go to libraries. They cannot be messed with by the mayor or the board. As a matter of public policy, that means that if we have a full on emergency and need to make tough cho choices and uh, fund the libraries less, we can't. Um, uh, the good news is that the libraries will be robustly funded as they have in the past. Uh, because this is an existing set aside, um, I have I had no problem supporting it. Uh, it is worth about eighty-three million dollars per year, and it does include. And this was an important provision uh, that I generally insist upon in the re-upping of existing set asides that have been approved by the voters in the past. Uh, that there are off ramps if you will, uh, for what happens uh, in a economic downturn. And in this particular case, uh, this allows the city to temporarily freeze increases to the annual minimum funding when the city uh, is facing a budget deficit of $300 million per year. Uh, and I have um, been on the board in 2008 when the city was facing a deficit in excess of $300 million. Uh, so that would freeze spending at its current level and not allow for an increase. Very sensible, fiscally prudent provision. Um, and that is Proposition F, which I think also uh, has no official opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No paid arguments there either. 
Um, okay, no questions. We're going to move forward on to uh, G, uh, success fund. Yeah, there are. This is one of two set asides on our ballot. One at the state. Uh, which Ooh, I think actually, uh, Supervisor Peskin, yeah. apologies, uh, but one question did just come up, which I thought might be just good, good to raise quickly here. Um, it's along the topic of set asides. Yeah. Um, you know, there are quite a few set asides. Uh, what happens when we have an economic recession and budget cuts are required? Right. Uh, so let's let's start with the beginning of set asides in San Francisco. All of them amendments to the charter. The first one actually started uh, in I want to say 1917, which exists to this day, which is a set aside for the San Francisco Symphony that still exists. Um, and along the way, there have been set asides for children's services, for uh, the libraries. Uh, the fire department has a set aside of its own. There are a number of set asides that have accumulated over the years. I believe at last count, we were at 15 of them. Um, and in the last Oh, decade or so um, at the controller's urging and suggestion, um, and this has been the case uh, with all of the modern set-asides, we have included the kind of language that I just spoke to, Howard, um, which is language that when the city is facing a large deficit, it can freeze the amount and if you actually look at the one that we're getting to, and this might be a good jump off to Proposition G, um, there are actually provisions that even allow the amount to be reduced. So not just frozen, but reduced. And you will see that in the Student Success Fund uh, Charter measure that is Proposition G. Um, and uh, by the way, there is a $1 billion set aside that is Proposition 28 also for education of our young in the state of California. So there are two set asides relating to this. Um, bottom line is that in the state of California, uh, our schools, our K through 12 public uh, education system is lagging. We are, uh, the last I looked, um, 40 something out of 50 states uh, in the country and San Francisco is no exception to that rule. Um, this measure uh, would for a 15 year period uh, provide an escalating amount of revenue to the San Francisco Unified School District. Mind you, uh, when you pay your property taxes, a portion of that goes to the school district and a portion of that goes to the city. Uh, this would mean that the city is augmenting the portion that goes to the school district uh, with, to my mind, appropriate oversight, which would allow schools uh, to apply for grants up to a million dollars uh, under this set aside. Um, as I said, it does have off ramps um, that are set forth. I can read them to you uh, as to uh, instances where there is a $200 million projected shortfall or deficit uh, of the city. Um, and the one thing that particularly impressed me uh, and weighed on me in the Student Success Fund discussions uh, where I early on was a holdout um, was an interesting fact. And that is that San Francisco is one of five counties in the state of California that enjoys what is called an ERAF surplus from the state of California. Um, ERAF is the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. And the because of the way San Francisco's um, tax structure uh, and state law work, over the last many years, and you will see this in the ballot handbook, the city and county have uh, has been rebated from the state of California in excess of $300 million per year. And in light of that, uh, I felt that the voting by 
a set aside a portion not to exceed $60 million per annum for a period of 15 years was an appropriate thing to do for educating our children. Um, that is kind of the short and long of it. I'm happy to get in the weeds on it. You will see that uh, as a fiscal planning tool, the amount of the uh, contribution to the Student Success Fund ramps up over a period of four years for fiscal planning and adjustment purposes for the city uh, from $11 million in its first year, which would be the fiscal year 23-24 next year, uh, up to a total of $60 million in 26-27. Uh, in an economic downturn, that can be reduced to $35 million in the remaining 15 years or in the remaining portion of the uh, period that this would be in effect. Okay, um, time for just one question. Uh, we'll get to more if we can at the end. Uh, Lucy Johns, I think just wanted clarification. Um, does this set aside go directly to the school district or through the Board of Education? It goes to the school district. It does not go to the Board of Education. Uh, and if you look at the back of the, if you look at the actual language at the back, uh, you will see um, the oversight process, but it goes to the district and not through the Board of Education. The Board of Education cannot touch it. All of that is set forth in the actual language, which uh, is at the back of the ballot handbook. Okay, I think we can go on from there. Proposition H. E, F, G, H, H. Um, this is the second time that H has been before the voters. It was before the voters about 15 years ago. The voters said no. We will see what the voters say this time around. Um, it is very simple. Uh, the highest turnout that we see in this city and in this country in the election cycles that come and go are during presidential elections. The lowest turnout that we generally see are during mayoral elections. Mayoral elections are held in odd years. There are no congressional races. There are no gubernatorial races. There are no presidential races on the, uh, when a mayor, district attorney, and sheriff are elected. Uh, the notion here is that those three races would be moved to uh, coincide with presidential election cycles. What that means for the first go around is that whoever our district attorney becomes, our current mayor and our current sheriff will have their existing terms extended by one year to coincide with the uh, presidential elections and from then on will be uh, on presidential cycles. Uh, the average turnout for mayoral elections has been 42%. The average turnout for presidential elections has been roughly twice that much at about 82%. Uh, so this is merely a question of, do you want your mayor on when more people vote or not? Uh, it's been very interesting to watch uh, the um, arguments uh, for and against this. Um, there are, uh, I'm just giving you anecdotals, uh, which is that my former colleague, Jane Kim, actually uh, thinks that electoral turnout in San Francisco is more moderate in presidential elections and that a quote unquote progressive has a better chance of winning in the current system. Um, the notion that compelled me to vote for this is that I think when more people vote, it is better. Uh, I don't really care whether it elects moderates or progressives. The mayor of the city and county of San Francisco was adamantly opposed to this measure. Um, why? is not totally clear to me. Their arguments um, 
weren't great. Uh, one of their arguments was we needed more elections to give more opportunities to put bonds and various financial instruments on the ballot. I don't think it's a catastrophic loss if we don't have an election calendar in 2023. We had, uh, count it, four elections calendared in 2022, albeit that that was exceptional. Um, if you look at the individuals who voted to put it on the ballot, uh, they actually are a uh, real spectrum of the political leanings of this Board of Supervisors, ranging from the more moderate members like Catherine Stephanie uh, to the most progressive members like Dean Preston. Um, Supervisor Walton voted uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this in public, but I'm just going to tell you, uh, he does not get along with the mayor and just could not stomach the notion of the mayor serving for an extra year. Not that anybody would necessarily beat her in 2023 or 2024. I personally think that the mayor's antipathy towards it um, is that people in this town are frustrated uh, for any number of reasons, not including two and a half years of our collective um, psychological impacts from COVID. And uh, I think that uh, she felt it would be better for her to run for re-election in 23 than 24, when people may be even more frustrated as we may be looking at an economic downturn. Uh, but that is all speculation on my part. Uh, three of, or two of the members who voted against it are particularly close to the mayor. Um, and again, that may or may not have motivated them. Um, there was also an argument that the mayor made uh, that because a number of collective bargaining agreements with municipal labor are expiring uh, in uh, 2024, that mayors might be inclined to uh, give municipal labor unions better contracts in exchange for support for a future for their re-election. I found that argument to be uh, hogwash and not convincing. So ultimately it is up to 50% plus one of the electorate as to whether or not they would like to move their mayoral district attorney and sheriff elections into even numbered presidential years. That is prop H in a nutshell. Thank you, Aaron. I think you had answered the only uh, question on this one. So we'll go on to I. I, I confess there are so many things on the ballot that I have to flip the page to remind myself which they are. Um, propositions I and J are inextricably linked. Um, and they, frankly, in my humble opinion, neither one of them should be on the ballot. Uh, here is what happened. There was a movement, uh, which movement has been around and gained steam to close JFK uh, to car traffic in Golden Gate Park, not MLK, JFK. Um, that was very controversial. You will all, you all remember that um, that portion of roadway has historically been closed on Sundays. Uh, I was on the Board of Supervisors years ago when we extended that closure to the entire weekend when people can skate and otherwise recreate on that 100-foot uh, wide strip of pavement that goes past our cultural institutions, the De Young and the Academy of Sciences and the Conservatory of Flowers. Um, there, that movement gained steam. The mayor endorsed the notion that JFK should be enclosed, close uh, car traffic uh, completely at all times. Uh, there were, it was extremely controversial when it came to the Board of Supervisors for a vote. Uh, the vote um, was seven to four. I was in the dissent uh, along with Supervisors Connie Chan, Shimon Walton, and Asha Safai. Uh, I um, actually was, I found the arguments of the neighboring supervisor, Connie Chan, who represents the Richmond district to be compelling, which was that she had, there was a third alternative, uh, which was a portion 
of JFK being open to one-way traffic between, I believe, 8th and Crossover Drive. Um, and she could not get the votes for that. And ultimately, uh, I personally did not vote for uh, closure. Um, but I lost that vote, and that was the will of the Board of Supervisors, and that is the law today. Uh, the good people of the Richmond and the Sunset gathered together and obtained with the help of the uh, De Young Museum and the Fine Arts Museums and their donors, the uh, more than the 8,979 signatures to put Proposition I on the ballot. Um, in essence, to reverse what the Board of Supervisors uh, voted to do. And even though I was in the dissent, I don't think it's a good idea, um, not just because uh, it's, I mean, I, I totally understand when, um, and this is exactly what the initiative petition measure uh, is about, which is the court of last resort is the voters. And it in no way offends me that the voters should second guess a decision of the Board of Supervisors. What does offend me is that in Proposition I, they not only took on JFK, but they also took on a separate close by related west side of San Francisco issue, which was the closure of the Great Highway, which we initially closed during COVID, subsequently amended to only close on weekends but Prop I has a defect that is, uh, to my mind, a poison pill. And that is that um, it also includes a provision that would prevent the city and county of San Francisco from removing the great highway, uh, would, would not allow the city to remove the great highway portion between Sloat and Skyline. Uh, now, I don't know how many of us as District 3, Telegraph Hill, Barbary Coast people know about that, but that is the portion of the Great Highway that is falling into the ocean because of sea level rise that we have to abandon, that after years of study and planning with the approval of the California State Coastal Commission, uh, we must abandon, and the fact that this would not allow us to do that is uh folly um that it, it is it, it is crazy it will cost a huge amount of money uh to maintain that portion of uh of the land that is soon going to be ocean and that estimated cost is 80 million dollars uh to um strengthen that portion of the great highway uh, the chances of our being given permission for that from the California Com Coastal Commission, of which I was a member for a number of years, are slim to none, and that is a profound defect in Proposition I. Uh, Proposition J, which I need to speak to in the next breath, uh, was put on by four supervisors, in essence, to give voters a choice it actually does nothing. It is purely politics. So people can say they're for J and against I, but if you read the fine print in J, if J passes uh, while the decision that we made um, that I was in the dissent on by a seven to four vote to close JFK, it actually allows the board of supervisors and mayor to amend our previous action. And it may well be that at some point in the future, uh, Supervisor Chan's compromise version uh, is something that we wanna consider. Um, again, this does not, uh, it, once the voters vote for it, then it can only be changed by the voters. Proposition J has language that if it does pass, the board can later amend it by a majority vote. So Aaron, are you recommending a no vote on both I and J? I, vote, I voted no on both. I mean, you can vote yes on J. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it just means that the exist, you're, you're just affirming the existing law, but it does not like some voter initiatives mean that it, the Board of Supervisors now or in the future cannot amend it. So I thought it was silly, so I voted no. Okay, uh, so on to uh, 
L because K was removed? Yeah, K, K is an interesting story that was put on just uh, as I jump over it by a um, by popular signature. Uh, once those things are turned in, the proponent actually loses control. They become, as a matter of law, uh, the property of the Department of Elections and the head of the Department of Elections. And once John Arntz determines that the requisite number of signatures has been collected, there is no way to get it off the ballot uh, unless a court removes it. Uh, the individuals who put this notion forward, which they thought was an Amazon tax that turned out not to tax Amazon, but to tax small businesses they were not intending to tax this is what happens when you do things and you don't have the benefit of city attorneys and controllers and tax experts. Uh, they realized after they had qualified it for the ballot that it was uh, also folly and they had to go and in essence sue the director of elections who did not oppose their lawsuit to remove their own initiative from the ballot and that cost them an additional fifty thousand dollars anyway live and learn um proposition uh l is the continuance of the twice passed uh by the voters of san francisco by more than two-thirds um originally passed in the 90s for a 15-year period and re up for an additional 15 year period half cent sales tax. So the state of California has a 8% sales tax. The voters of San Francisco, like 23 other counties in the state of California, impose upon themselves uh, an additional half cent sales tax that uh, raises or used to raise before COVID about $120 million a year that is allocated by the County Transportation Authority, uh, primarily to the Municipal Transportation Agency, AKA Muni, for everything from bus refurbishment to track replacement, uh, signalization of intersections, um, some amount of street repaving. Uh, it has historically also included some uh, uh, tree planting money, um, and it has also gone into large uh, projects like the Central Subway uh, and the Caltrain extension from 4th and King Street to the center of downtown. This is a this measure would re up that half cent sales tax for an additional 30 years to 2053 and it needs a two thirds majority 66 uh, and two thirds percent plus one to pass. It has enjoyed that kind of support in the past. We will see if in these uncertain times it gets it again. I commend it to you. Um, it does have uh, not organized opposition, but you will see in the ballot statement that there is an official ballot argument against it. I respectfully disagree with my friend George Wooding of the Coalition of San Francisco Neighborhoods, um, but we will see uh, how the voters vote come November 8th at 8 p.m. Okay, thanks, Aaron. So we're on to Proposition M. And to Karen, yes, Jay is a poll, but just uh, to that, I just I finally figured out how to get my chat up. It is also <laughs> designed to give voters a choice. So you can be you, you can be yes on closure and no on opening it. And so it's it's kind of a political tool to for the no on I folks to have a foil. Uh, Proposition M um, builds off of something that I passed uh, with more than 70% of the vote uh in march of 2020 um that seems like a long time ago but if you will recall uh we had um in a very very different world and a very very different economy a remarkable number of vacant ground floor neighborhood commercial storefronts and uh many of them were vacant because the property owners had 
what we call in real estate, unrealistic expectations of value that merchants uh, could not afford. And we heard story after story of individuals who uh, were um, getting new leases that were above and beyond their means and their leases were being terminated and those commercial establishments were being evicted. Uh, we passed that. Um, COVID happened two weeks later. I proposed to the Board of Supervisors that that tax not be implemented uh, for its initial year. That was the entire year of 2021. Uh, that tax went live in 2022. Um, I can tell you anecdotally uh, that in North Beach, um, it has motivated various people to rent their ground floor commercial spaces rather than pay that tax. It was a tax that I did not want to collect. It was a tax that was made to incentivize uh, behavior and is showing early promising results. Proposition M does the exact same thing for the estimated 40,000 vacant residential units in San Francisco. Uh, it exempts single family homes and duplexes. Uh, it has exceptions for units that are undergoing reconstruction or uh, have uh, experienced acts of God. Uh, it is an escalating tax. Uh, longer you keep it vacant, uh, the more it costs and can get as high as $20,000 per annum uh, if you've kept your unit vacant uh, for an extended period of time. It, again, is uh, designed to uh, incent property owners, um, particularly large property owners, um, to rent their vacant units speculators who uh, in certain markets bought up numerous units and were sitting on them waiting for them to gain value and uh, not renting them out to do so. Um, it is uh, unclear how much money it will bring in. Uh, the controller is very clear in his statement that it is an undetermined amount of money, uh, but he estimates that uh, it might collect $20 million a year. Any money that is collected would be put in a housing activation fund uh, that would provide rent subsidies for low-income seniors uh, and would also be used for the funding of the acquisition and uh, rehabilitation of affordable housing in San Francisco. Um, and yes, vacant is more than 182 days in a calendar year. And uh, Paul Liao has a question. Does Prop M uh, prevent uh, this tax uh, from increasing in future years? It does. It's Well, it, it increases up to, so let me just uh, read you that portion. Uh, it would take effect in 2024. And for a particular owner, uh, it would escalate to a maximum over a period of time to $20,000 if the same owner kept a, the same unit vacant for consecutive years. Beyond that, it does not increase. The second it is rented, it ceases. And um, this was, by the way, I, I neglected to go back to my initial thing. This was not put on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors. This was put on the ballot through the collection of signatures. And um, so a number of individuals and organizations uh, obtained the more than 8,979 signatures. And uh, Jonathan Bonato asks, is nonprofit sponsored affordable housing exempt from M? Yes, it is. Okay. And um, uh, so it applies to buildings of three units or more. Um, it increases, I'm just reading from the uh, argument, uh, increases the longer a unit stays vacant. Um, single family homes and duplexes are exempt as are units vacant due to repairs, new construction, 
uh, disaster or death and does not apply to units owned by nonprofits. And Shelly Bell asks, uh, says that some landlords have said they're trying to rent units, but the exodus from San Francisco is making it difficult and they feel they are being unfairly penalized. Is there some process to show for effort? So isn't it weird, Diana, that in Proposition D and E, we have a housing crisis and in Proposition M, people can't rent their units. I will say this, and this is a personal statement. Uh, my wife and I are small property owners in San Francisco and own seven units of residential rental housing, all of them rent controlled. You can see it on my form 700s that are available on the internet. Uh, we have never had a problem, not now or during COVID or before COVID in renting any of those units. I think it is really a function of what one's expectations of value are, but there is no shortage of demand in San Francisco. Uh, and then um, the last question, then we need to move on. Um, are there, uh, Neville Morkham asks, are there provisions to prevent landlords from renting to undesirable tenants simply to avoid the tax? Um, no, I don't think that that would be constitutional, but uh, chapter 37 of our administrative code and other laws uh, certainly pertain to the eviction of uh, tenants who violate rental agreements and contracts uh, and the like. So uh, that would be the response to that question. But I don't think, it, but there is no provision in Proposition M uh, that says who a tenant can be or what qualifications they need to have. Okay, are you, uh, oh, oh, you recommend? Paul, I see Paul's question. Paul, oh. no, that this has, this is residential only. The measure that we passed um, would not be affected by this at all. This is the commercial uh, vacancy tax is still the law. It can only be undone by the voters of San Francisco. This is a residential vacancy tax, not a commercial vacancy tax. The one that I, uh, brought before the voters in 2020 um, will uh, is not impacted by this at all. It's just they basically riffed off of my 2020 law is all I was saying by way of introduction. So Aaron, just to finish up, um, the uh, San Francisco Chronicle is saying to vote no. What's your position? I voted yes for Proposition M. OK, let's uh, move on to Proposition M. Uh, proposition N. Oh, Proposition N um, is an interesting thing. Um, uh, this is in some ways related not to INJ in specific, um, but uh, one of, it, during the entire controversial discussion about the closure of JFK, and as the two institutions, the California California Academy of Sciences and the DeYoung Museum were vociferously opposed to the JFK closure. Uh, naturally, the discussion of the Warren Hellman uh, initiated 800 car parking garage that is underneath the concourse uh, between the DeYoung and the Academy uh, was implicated in those discussions. And I don't know if any of you have utilized that garage, um, but this is not a subjective uh, statement. This is an objective statement. It is vastly underutilized. Um, and uh, this is a subjective statement. It is terribly mismanaged. Um, the city and county of San Francisco uh, two departments, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency and our Department of Recreation and Parks have long been in the parking business. The concourse authority that was created in 1998 through the passage of Proposition J uh, created in that law a concourse authority that 
um, is not under the control of the city. This would dissolve the concourse authority and devolve its uh, authority um, to the Rec and Park Commission, which is in the garage business. Um, it would uh, otherwise obviate other parts of the 1998 Proposition J that would allow us to refinance at a much more favorable interest rate the remaining debt on that garage, uh, which would drive down the parking rates in that garage. This is all uh, aimed at better utilization and pricing in the concourse garage to address the JFK closure. It is long overdue. It was put on the ballot uh, by the mayor. I don't think that there is any opposition to it. It should have, as I said, been done long ago. Yeah, there's no. No, no opposition. So we can uh, go on to Prop O, the last San Francisco proposition. Yeah, um, I hate to oppose money for education. I am the product of a K through 12 and UC education, all of it public. Um, I believe in San Francisco Community College. Uh, I have been a proponent for many, many years in addressing any number of city colleges woes uh, in my position as a member of the Board of Supervisors, including but not limited uh, to supporting general obligation bonds for that institution, in supporting a parcel tax for that institution, in harnessing the city attorney's office to defend and litigate uh, the attempt by the Accreditation Commission to de-accredit that facility. And it is with a heavy heart, but vociferously, that I oppose Proposition O, which was put on the ballot uh, by popular signature, uh, in part because they wanted to get around the two-thirds uh, requirement. And when voters put it on, it's a 50% requirement. Uh, I am, and I don't mean to be too demonstrative, but I am offended by this for two reasons. Number one, the existing parcel tax that if you are a property owner or a landlord, you currently pay per parcel doesn't expire until 2032. And I think it is the height of arrogance and fiscal impropriety to layer on a second parcel tax when you told the voters uh, only a handful of years ago that the first parcel tax was going to address your financial needs. I think that is entirely inappropriate. Um, uh, and by the way, it's not just property owners that pay this because a landlord can pass half of it on to his or her or their tenants. Um, the second thing that is uh, extremely problematic about this is twofold. One, uh, what the proponents of this measure sought to do without consulting with the city and county of San Francisco, its tax collector, its treasurer, or its controller is to have a differentiated tax that if you look at this ranges from 150 to $4,000 per parcel. So a single, single family residential property pays $150, a non-residential property over 100,000 square feet pays $4,000, a non-residential property between 25,000 and 100,000 square feet uh, pays $2,500, I'm sorry, over 100,000 is $4,000. Anyway, there's a graduated list that goes from 150 to $4,000. The problem with that is insofar as this measure requires the city and county of San Francisco, not the community college district to collect these taxes, we don't have any information about these kind of building typologies as it relates to tax collection. Undertaking that project is going to cost $6 million. Collecting the taxes is going to cost the city $3 million a year going forward. The way these schmucks wrote this thing, it caps the amount of money that they reimburse the city for collecting their taxes at $1 million a year. So generally the way this works 
is when a entity that uses the city to collect its taxes puts a tax proposal on the ballot, they compensate the tax collector for the costs that it takes to collect the tax. But in this case, not only are they layering on a new tax when their last one didn't expire, but this is going to cost the city $6 million up front and $2 million per annum every year that's going to come out of the city's general fund. And I just, I, I can not countenance that. And I am, uh, you will see in the ballot handbook, one of the official opponents of Proposition O. So we're down to the end. We're almost to seven o'clock. Um, I uh, like to promise people we'll leave on time. Um, there is a question from Teresa Flandrich to clarify uh, two points regarding D&E. But before you do that, I just want to say that on the back page of the document that we gave you, that was the um, summary document for note taking, there's a list of uh, list of resources for both state and local uh, propositions, as well as candidates uh, and different organizations that are recommending candidates. Um, I don't know if, uh, Aaron, you want to stay on for maybe uh, five or 10 minutes more sure. to sure. talk talk about a couple things, um, both a, a question I have about state, a couple of state initiatives, and then uh, to clarify uh, Teresa's. Otherwise, people, you're free to go to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for humoring me. It was great. If we could clap, we would. So do you want to take um, uh, Teresa's question? And uh, oh, uh, uh, where is Teresa's question? She says she needs clarification on two points regarding d and &E. So um, well, I guess I we have to see it. I, maybe I'm we not. have to unmute. I think okay. it's private to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so okay. am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah, you're unmuted. OK, worry, so, so um, thank you so much, Supervisor Peskin. Um, a couple of, of points about the differences between D&E. Which one actually requires a higher, the higher percentage e. of affordable units for middle to low income folks? E, e, of, e requires a higher percentage. OK, and, and I'm thinking particularly about D3, um, North Beach in particular. Um, so also in terms of which one requires actual housing for families? Um, do both of them do that or is there? No, only E requires a mix of units as the Board of Supervisors have has historically required, which is a spreading of one bedroom studio and family size, three bedroom, uh, et cetera, type units that is not included in D, it is an E. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, and again, while I said that, you know, I don't think either one of these uh, belong on the ballot, um, clearly in, to my mind, E is the better choice. So just a couple of questions around the state ballot and- um, uh-oh, now I'm going to get in trouble. The only, the only question we posed to you was, is there any, um, because we didn't want to give you too many assignments tonight, is is there any of the propositions um, of uh, on the state ballot that you think are most relevant to uh, San Francisco or local municipalities? One is, and then, um, one seems to be Proposition 30, uh, which is an initiative providing funding for programs to reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to speak to any of them. I um, am a absolute flag waving proponent of Proposition 30. Um, our world is in a ton of trouble. Uh, we have to figure out how to finance the future um, we've all lived it. I mean, we lived with orange skies. We've just seen the first time an algal bloom has happened in San Francisco Bay since 1964, before the advent of the Clean Water Act. We are in a lot of trouble. 
Uh, I um, absolutely support it. I am. I note that it is funded in large part by Lyft because Lyft wants to uh, get as many zero emission vehicles for their drivers as possible. That does not trouble me. Um, this obviously uh, raises taxes for earners over $2 million. That also does not trouble me. Uh, we are in a lot of trouble. Um, this is, uh, I mean, this is uh, supported by San Francisco Planning and Urban Research Spur. Um, uh, it is an interesting cast of characters that are supporting it. Um, it is obviously uh, opposed by the governor um, and I can give you my thoughts on that, but I am a flag-waving supporter of Proposition 30. So, uh, Paul Liao uh, asks whether you're willing to give just a minimum uh, of your, uh, on each of the state props and your position. Yeah, let me just do it at a, at a really high level. Um, uh, proposition one, reproductive freedom, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, if for no other reason, making that statement enshrining the right uh, of a woman's right to choose in our constitution uh, at this moment in time in this country um, is absolutely the right message from the state of California. Uh, as to the two gaming propositions, uh, I say, no, I don't know if you know my background. Um, in, in my real life, uh, I work for Native American Indian tribes and am a big supporter of tribal sovereignty, uh, but this actually does nothing for uh, tribal casinos that in some cases are lifeblood. Uh, Prop 27, uh, which is being backed by uh, out, of state, out of state online uh, gaming would actually be harmful to the existing uh, compacts to um, recognize Indian tribes that have gaming in the state of California. So I am uh, no on 26 and 27. We discussed Proposition 28, uh, which is the uh, set aside for the state's ailing school system uh, for arts funding, which to my mind are as important as STEM, math and science, and English uh, in our public schools. Um, I am sick and tired of the various forces uh, from insurance and medical worlds uh, going, putting dialysis stuff uh, and labor worlds on our ballots, and they should do that job in Sacramento and am voting no on Proposition 29. Uh, we discussed Prop 30. Prop 31 actually is a replay of what happened in San Francisco. You will recall that the Board of Supervisors on the local level took on big tobacco and vaping. And big tobacco's response to that was that they referended the law that the Board of Supervisors passed and the mayor signed. And the voters of San Francisco saw through that. Prop 31 is the exact same thing relative to the state legislature, which is the state legislature uh, prohibited uh, the retail sale of certain flavored tobacco products that were being targeted towards our children. Uh, and this is an attempt to referend and overturn that, which means that you have to vote yes, which <laughs> it, so you are voting to, in essence, uphold the law that the legislature passed. So yes on Proposition 31, do not prohibit, uh, do not overturn uh, the prohibition. Okay, thanks so much. So I think we should let you, you go to dinner too. Well, maybe Aaron, we'll so. bump into you because we're, we're headed, we're heading down the street for dinner. So we'll see any refugees <laughs> uh, from this Zoom meeting. And thank you all for your time and don't forget to vote. Okay, everybody, thanks for showing up. Thanks, Aaron. Bye.